brain tumors, it's important to understand that they can originate from anywhere within the brain. You can have gliomas, meningiomas, pituitary tumors, uh, tumors of the neuromas. So anywhere within the brain, these tumors can originate. Now with, uh, with brain tumors, as with any type of uh, tumor, we have malignant versus benign tumors. And with the brain, we have primary mal malignant versus secondary malignant. With primary malignant, it means that the tumor actually began within the head, within the brain, and it's contained within there. With secondary malignant, it means that the tumor originated somewhere else in the body and metastasized to the brain. Now with brain tumors, malignant uh, tumors generally have a, a fairly high mortality rate. And according to cancer.org, the five-year mortality rate or survival rate for individuals that develop glio, glioblastomas is about 4%. Now on the other end though, meningiomas, malignant meningiomas, five-year survival rate is about 92%. So it will, it will vary based on the type of tumor and the biggest, one of the biggest factors is going to be age with younger people having a much higher survival rate than elderly people. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into material. Um, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to hit me up after the video. Thank you. All right, so let's dive in a little bit more into brain tumors. What uh, they are, some of the nursing care for this, and how we can best care for our patients who may be experiencing a brain tumor. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about some of the risk factors associated with brain tumors. So the one of the biggest risk factors is going to be genetics. Another one's going to be environment, how the patient was raised, uh, what sort of environment are they growing in. Uh, then another one would be ionizing radiation, they've been exposed to radiation, and then lastly, previous head injury. They've had a head in injury in the past, this may be a risk factor for developing um, tumor in the future. So this little MRI right here shows kind of the cross sections of the brain and what a tumor might look like on an MRI. Of course it's not going to come up pink like that, but that's kind of what a tumor is going to look like when it comes up on an MRI. And like I said, a, a tumor is really uh, an overgrowth of cells, um, uncontrolled growth of the cells. They can be benign or malignant. And we understand that benign, of course, means it's not cancerous, where malignant means that it would be cancerous. And then, like we talked about in the intro, um, they can be primary or secondary. Primary meaning that the, they originated within the brain, and that's where the growth initially uh, originated. Or they can be secondary, meaning that the, that the tumor growth, the, the <clears throat> tumor growth metastasized from a location outside of the of the brain. Okay? So when we talk about brain tumors, there's there's multiple uh, there's one thing we need to understand. First of all is this difference between supertentorial and infratentorial. You may already know this, but but the you know, if we look at this here, this is a cerebrum, of course, is, is kind of what we would classify as the brain, what the layperson would kind of call the brain. Then we have the cerebellum kind of here at the bottom, and then we have the brain stem coming down from there. So the supertentorial region, what we have, the, the, the division between the cerebellum and the cerebrum is called the tentorium, okay? The supratentorial area is known uh, is the area above the cerebellum. The infratentorial area is the area below the cerebellum. And then we have brain stem. So some of the signs and symptoms that a patient may experience when they have a brain tumor are first of all going to be um, nausea, vomiting, okay? They may experience headache, personality changes, irritability, drowsiness, depression, and then decreased cardiac and respiratory function. Now what can be the problem here is if, if you have a tumor, you know, that's growing right here, is it, it's impossible to see that. It's not like some sort of skin irritation or, or other sorts of diseases where it's very easy to spot. These tumors can grow and they can get fairly large before the patient uh, 
exhibit symptoms or exhibit symptoms to the point that the family thinks it's important to bring them in. Because a lot of these patients are going to be elderly patients where, you know, they, they may already, already be experiencing some, some drowsiness, a little bit of depression, uh, irritability. They may, the family may just associate it with, um, <clears throat> you know, just getting older and then forgetfulness and things like that. Families oftentimes don't associate that with uh, the potential that the, the, the family member has a, a tumor. They oftentimes just think that it's the person aging or, or something like that, and they may not bring the person in until there's greater symptoms of complete forgetfulness or falling or, or things like that. Okay, so, and then, like I said here, this area, this kind of here is the tentorium, and then we have supratentorium, infratentorium, and brainstem. So there are different symptoms associated with if the if the uh, tumor were to be supratentorial and some of those would be um, seizures, visual changes, slurred speech, paralysis, short-term memory loss, and gait disturbance. So one of the biggest risk factors or complications with seizures is going to or tumors is going to be seizures. As this tumor grows the patient may develop uh, seizures. So that's always something to watch out for with your patient. Okay. Now, if the, if the tumor were to be located in the brainstem, some of the things that we are going to look for with that are going to be, so this is the brainstem here. So if we have a, a patient who's experiencing it there, we might notice visual changes, headaches, clumsiness, hearing loss, the personality changes. And then if the pra patient has the tumor actually in the cerebellum, so infratentorial, we might notice um, increasing ICP, vomiting, headache, uncoordinated muscle movement, and problems walking. Of course, the cerebellum is involved in um, coordinate and in, in balance and coordination and things like that. So, if we have a tumor in the cerebellum, we will notice some of those changes. Okay. So, as a nurse, we have a patient who comes in, and they're experiencing some of these these uh, signs and symptoms. Well, the first thing we're going to do, we're not, it's hard to just automatically assume that it's a brain tumor. So one of the first things we're going to do are going to be MRIs and CTs. The first thing that's most likely going to be done is just going to be a CT. They come in with some memory loss. Um, they're, they're probably going to do a CT to, to rule out bleeding um, and to rule out like a hemorrhagic stroke. Now, if they notice on the CT, they may notice a little bit of a growing there. If they notice that there's some growth, a little bit of a tumor, they'll probably take them for an MRI to get a little bit better view of the location and what's going on there. A couple other things that may be done to kind of rule out other diseases would be um, blood tests, blood work, to see if it may be a sign of uh, the confusion, the irritability, and things might be from um, uh, infection or... And then the the... The last thing that we're going to do is we really diagnose this is going to be um, a cerebral biopsy. That's going to be the best way to determine if this is malignant or not. Now, prior to doing cerebral biopsy, they may CT scan like the abdomen, um, chest, and, and a couple different areas to see if there's any sorts of tumors anywhere else. The reason for that is it's it's it can be somewhat difficult and much more invasive to biopsy brain tissue. Of course, we have the skull, and on top of that, if there's a diffuse growth, it can be really hard to find a good area to actually even get a sample. So what they may do is they may uh, CT the abdomen, see if there's any growth in the lungs, you know, the liver, uh, in the abdomen itself. And, and what they'll do if they find any there is they'll biopsy that tissue. And if that's malignant, then there's a pretty good chance that the um, tumor growth within the in the in the brain itself is actually going to be malignant as well. Okay, so that's kind of the way that they would work that. Now, with our nursing care, some of the things we're going to want to keep in mind with our patients. First of all, like we talked about, the patient may ex begin to experience difficulty breathing. So as always, we're going to think ABCs. Are they going to be able to maintain their airway? These patients can actually lose consciousness and deteriorate um, their, all, their mental status very quickly. So we'll need to monitor that very closely and um, ensure that they're able to maintain their airway. Other things we're going to do is we're just monitor their neurological status. Usually it's going to be Q2 hours, possibly Q1 hour. 
Okay. And we'll want, we'll want to do a full, full neuro exam, pupils, movement, orientation every two hours, um, possibly every one hour. A lot of times we're going to implement seizure precautions. We talked in one of the recent videos about seizures. We're going to want to implement seizure precautions um, because as these tumors grow, one of our biggest uh, complications is going to be seizures. So padded side rails. Um, and the patient will probably be on Keppra um, and possibly uh, like Dilantin. Okay. And then, you know, other AEDs, um, uh, anti epileptic drugs, the patient may be on as well. Okay. But before we talk about that, we can, we can talk about meds here a little bit more in depth. So let's talk about some of the meds the patient's going to be given. So, the, like I just mentioned in the last slide there, meds, of course, are going to be anti-seizure meds, our AEDs, uh, Keppra, um, possibly Dilantin. Um, and this will depend on if the patient has had seizures, uh, the risk of the seizures, etc. Another thing we're going to give is going to be corticosteroids. The reason for that is that's going to decrease inflammation within that brain tissue. Um, as that tumor begins to grow, there's not much space for it to kind of push the brain tissue. Of course, let's say here's our skull, here's our, our cerebrum. As that grows, it's going to kind of take up all this space. And if that happens, we run the risk of the patient. Let's say this is our foramen magnum and brainstem. We run the risk of our patient pushing their brain tissue out of their skull and herniating. So that would be a big complication. One thing we can do to help counteract that or to prevent that is going to be to give corticosteroids, which are going to decrease inflammation. Okay, and hopefully kind of prevent that and just just kind of prevent that tissue from swelling too much and maybe delaying some of those neuro changes. Other things we're going to give are going to be anti-emetics. Anti. Um, because the patients are going to, uh, as you saw with a lot of the symptoms, are going to have nausea, vomiting. So we can give anti-emetics to help prevent that. Okay. So those will be kind of the meds you're going to give for your patient. And then let's talk about what may be done. So if, if the physician and the family decide that craniotomy is what needs to be done, this is actually a craniotomy of a frontal tumor. So what they actually do is they'll remove the skin and they'll drill a hole in the skull. And from there, they can actually visualize the tumor and resect it. If it's very localized, if it's more... Um, diffuse and there's a bunch of areas it may be very hard for them to get it out or to get a lot of it out they'll have to be very careful around blood vessels and nerves so they can use uh like nerve stimulators to try to determine where nerves are uh, so these are these can be very complex and long drawn out surgeries but they they can patients can um improve after this um, now outcomes vary based on location of the tumor size and complexity of the growth within the brain tissue but patients can see some improvement after this okay so that's going to be craniotomy after craniotomy we're going to post, post procedure the patient will probably be intubated possibly sedated and on seizure medications as they go in there manipulate that nerve tissue um, they, they run a risk of, of um, seizures as well so we're going to be keeping them on those AEDs um, the patient will most likely be in PO for a little bit. We're going to be doing repeat follow-up CTs and MRIs to see if the patient is improving and if there's any um, post-op, uh, abnormal post-op changes. So that's kind of what a craniotomy is. This is kind of a, a bigger craniotomy of a frontal tumor, but these are very common in intensive care units and in uh, neurosurgical intensive care units. Okay, so let's talk lastly about some of the complications of these tumors. We've talked about a few of them already. We talked about uh, seizures. Okay, that's going to be one of the big complications. And then, of course, just all these neuro changes. Um, those are hard for the family. Herniation. Herniation. We talked about that. Let's say this is kind of the skull. Let's say this is the brain. Brain stem. The brain stem comes out of the skull through this big hole called the foramen. Magnum. Let's say this is the head. Okay, this is our person. Um, what can happen as this tissue swells is the brain can actually kind of collapse on itself and it can push through these little holes and it can cause issues there. Okay, another complication is going to be issues with the pituitary gland. Now, 
there can be other complications as well, but we have our pituitary gland that sits right here within the brain. And the pituitary gland is, gland is called the master gland a lot of times because the pituitary gland secretes a lot of hormones, stores and secretes a lot of hormones that are used in various places throughout the body. One of these hormones is ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so we think about the name. Anti means not or to not or whatever. Diuretic means to pee or urinate, and then it's a hormone. So antidiuretic hormone is secreted from here, and what it does is it, it stops the body from peeing. Okay, when, when we need to retain fluid and we need to, re to concentrate our, uh, when we need to retain fluid, this antidiuretic hormone is secreted from the pituitary, posterior pituitary, and we retain fluids. Now, when patients experience um, these brain tumors and the swelling within the brain, they can cause damage to the pituitary gland. When the pituitary gland is damaged, we are, one of the complications is that we may not be able to secrete antidiuretic hormone as needed. So what can happen here is the patient will no longer be able to, um, to concentrate their urine and they're just going to pee massive, massive, massive amounts of fluid, just incredibly dilute urine. So the thing we're going to do with this is we're going to give huge amounts of fluid to the patient and we're going to try to replace the amount of fluid that's coming out. But these patients can do liters and liters of, of urine um, when that becomes damaged. Okay, so that's one of the big complications with that. Um, one, of, one of the things we're going to want to keep in mind with our patients is that th this is a very scary moment for them. Um, there, are, there is high mortality associated with some of these different brain tumors. The highest mortality is going to be with a, a gli like a glioblastoma, and that's going to be a tumor in the glial cells. And what these glial cells do is, we talked about this before as well, but what the neuroglia do is they maintain homeostasis. They, they create myelin and provide support to the neurons throughout the brain. So with elderly patients, there is a mortality, a five-year mortality rate, uh, or survival rate, I should say, of just 4%. And that's for every patient over 55. Even for younger patients of 20 to 44, the mortality rate is still just 17%. Okay, and that's with uh, these glioblastomas. Now, there are higher mortality rates, like with meningiomas for younger patients. It's as high as 92%. Um, and this is according to cancer.org. These are five-year survival rates. So we really want to educate our patients on, on what's going on, kind of the care we're going to be giving them, and what they can expect in the coming days, weeks, months, years um, with the tumor that they have. Okay, you guys, thank you so much for checking us out. If you want to reach me, you can reach me at contact at nrsng.com. Uh, you can also check out our books at nursingstudentbooks.com, the blog, and you